So welcome everyone, and thank you for being here for today's webinar on the global AMR crisis is the scale of the action matching the scale of the threat. My name is John Rex, and I'm your chairman for the next 90 minutes. Um, and I am, uh, my, my background is shown here on this slide. I do a variety of things across the industry, uh, including a, a putting out a newsletter on a regular basis. Um, today's event is a follow-up from a 2020 meeting that was uh, also sponsored by Pfizer, as is today's meeting, uh, as part of their work on tackling AMR and improving patient access to effective antibiotics. And um, today's event, this follow-up event, uh, has uh, has is builds on the holistic value of antibiotics that we discussed in 2020. And what we're seeking to do today is to think about how understanding right incentives can stimulate improved patient access and innovation and any effectives and also to talk about providing a practical framework for each stakeholder to support implementation of national AMR action plans. So our faculty who I'll be introducing as we go along uh, includes leading members from the WHO, clinical practice, government agency bodies, industry, uh, private sector and policy arena. Several of these people wear several hats. So. We've actually got a, a really kind of a, a broad scope here of, of folks to talk about this problem of creating the, the antibiotics that we need for today, but also for tomorrow and for tomorrow's after that, because having the right antibiotics in advance is the equivalent of having a good fire extinguisher to put out a fire. It gives you a tool you can work with. You don't have to wait to develop. So um, some, some general notes for you, the audience. Uh, Please uh, be aware that there, the session is being recorded. There's going to be a playback of this made available during the World Antibiotic Awareness Week, which is coming up November 18 to 24. Take a look on the WHO website for ideas about how to you know, spread the, the, the ideas of, uh, about antibiotic awareness and microbial resistance during that week. Um, there's going to be a Q&A towards the end of the of this 90 minutes there will be a little bit of q a as we go along but there will be a q a where i'm actually looking for questions and ideas from you the audience there's a chat that you can put uh questions into please please do that um if it's like last year we won't have time to get to all the questions but but the uh, the uh sponsors do get back to everybody ultimately with uh, with responses to questions so put your question in and let's see if we can see how much we can work through today um, and I think that is covers my uh, my introductions for today. So um, let's move on then. Um, our, our speakers are shown here, and I think rather than run through everybody's name uh, on this slide, I'm going to take everybody as they come up. So off we go. Um, the uh, the agenda is begins with uh, presentations by. Uh, well, actually, you know what? I'm just going to because the agenda will make itself really really clear as we go along. We will finish in. 86 minutes. So our first speaker is uh, Professor Hanan Baki, who is a physician pediatrician who started her work in Saudi Arabia, but has moved up steadily and is now the uh, uh, at the WHO, where she is uh, uh, Assistant Director General for Antimicrobial Resistance. Um, you, you will know her work from the many committees that, that work globally across the world. To, uh, to drive things like the responses to Ebola and uh, other sorts of work on, on um, international collaborations. And so um, w welcome, Dr. Balki, and over to you for your introductory comments. Thank, thank you very much, uh, very much appreciated. Um, uh, John, it's great to see you and, and colleagues here today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from Geneva. I'm very delighted to be able to start this extremely important panel today where we're asking ourselves, is the scale of the action matching the scale of the threat for antimicrobial resistance, obviously? The answer is a clear no. And the reason is because we are dealing with a very complex public health challenge. We're dealing with more than one pathogen, not just one. We're dealing with evolving bacteria that in order to survive are sharing genetic material to build newer and newer resistance mechanisms, which is much faster than the timelines we have for producing newer agents to say the least. 
We're dealing with the need to prioritize economical and financial gains from the use of these antimicrobials in other sectors. These are the same antimicrobials we need to treat patients and we, uh, to, pre to prevent death and the, from the simplest infections. So we need to ramp up innovation in all sectors, whether it's R&D for tools such as diagnostics, therapeutics or vaccines, or innovation in processes, managing the whole ecosystem in which we live in. We have come a long way, uh, but we are still not at the scale of action that is needed to tackle this crisis. In a recent analysis of the G7 and the G20 commitments since 2015, my division uh, of AMR at WHO, which is a new division, by the way, only established in uh, 2019, we found that there was no lack of uh, language in the declarations of the leaders, uh, ministers of health and agriculture. However, what we do not see is a match in the political and financial commitments toward implementing and supporting national action plans at the country level. Nor have we seen the level of financial support for the development of innovative tools needed for the human and animal health or the tools needed to sustain clean and sanitary environments. Earlier this year, even under the heavy weight of the COVID pandemic, the UN high level meeting and the call to action took place in April for AMR. 113 member states signed up and 38 supporting organizations as well. This call to action is extremely welcomed. However, it needs to be translated into practice. I, went, I want to end uh, by reminding everyone that the fact of the matter remains that only 15% of countries have funded national action plans. There's a wealth, good amount of guidance from WHO, OIE, FAO, and UNEP. In fact, the tripartite joint secretariat, which is uh, hosted at the WHO, is at uh, the, uh, the tail end of finalizing the five-year technical, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, the five-year strategic framework, as well as the two-year the two AMR uh, work plan, including UNEP. But at the end, the national action plans need to be adequately resourced at country level. So if we are serious about bending the curve on antimicrobial resistance and creating a true lasting impact, we need leaders to prioritize AMR and promote innovative uh, solutions uh, on sustainable financing mechanisms to support these uh, national action plans. But we also need the scientific community, the private sector, civil society, literally all of us here today, politicians, to provide the innovation needed to support the tools that I had mentioned that's within the full armamentarium of the AMR sphere. So I'm very happy to be with you here today and I'm looking forward to a, a, an amazing discussion and looking forward to further collaborations and engaging with all of you. John, back to you. Super, th th thank you for those comments. And something that, uh, to today's conversation, we have three people who are close to or are part of this thing called the Global Leaders Group, which you'll hear a little bit later on. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Wheeler and Honorable Shiozaki are both part of that, and, and you interact with that through the Tripartite Secretariat. Can you expand a little bit on how political momentum gets built uh, through, these, through the interactions of these groups from your perspective? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think the colleagues uh, online also who, who might want to add to that. But the Global Leaders Group was one of the major global governance of AMR that was uh, called upon by the IECG recommendations that were completed in 2019. It is led by the Prime Minister uh, of Barbados and Prime Minister of um, Bangladesh. And it has within it, uh, you know, the uh, diversity of agriculture, human environment, science, and civil society as well to really be the political advocates for the AMR agenda. Uh, this group has really moved uh, forward quite fast, I have to say, by establishing their own work plans, prioritizing their KPIs, and we're looking forward on relying on them a lot to enhance this uh, global movement and drawing the attention toward the AMR agenda for the issues that I had mentioned before with specific engagement with bodies such as G7 and G20. So please visit their website. There's, uh, they have developed several 
critical, uh, well-written white papers on surveillance, finance, the environment, climate. So there's a lot of wealth of information coming out of this group. And um, uh, feel free to visit their, their website. Thank you. Super. Th thank you for the orientation. The, the acronyms take a little getting used to, but once yes. you figure it out, there's actually uh, a lot of power in what these groups are doing. So we're going to move on now from uh, for the, from Dr. Balki's uh, overview of sort of the global perspective. We will be coming back to the political global perspective as well to two other pieces of it. And the first other piece has to do with patient access and uh, and also in how you bring innovative tools to patients in all parts of the world. And for that, we have Dr. David Patterson from the, the land down under, who is a physician who has spent his career thinking about the problem of developing uh, the data required to know how to use antibiotics and taking care of patients. He's also a consultant to infectious diseases uh, in Brisbane. So um, rest of his CV is on the screen, uh, David over to you for your comments on patient access and antibiotic innovation. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, John, for that introduction. I'll just get my first slide up. You should have control. Okay, here it is. So I'd like to, you know, start this discussion by looking at how we can move forward to secure patient access and how can we really move ahead to reinvigorate uh, antibiotic innovation. I would like just to pause for a second and disclose that I have worked with a number of companies who, who are illustrated there, some of which are antibiotic development, others are vaccine or uh, diagnostics companies. So as John said, I come from Australia, and I think Australia is the only country on earth that actually celebrates the discovery and development of antibiotics on a banknote. So this is uh, Howard Florey, who didn't discover penicillin, of course, that was Fleming, but uh, Florey was really the person who, with his team at Oxford, were able to move forward and allow penicillin to be produced in, in substantial quantities. And indeed, in my practice, uh, I've had patients who've uh, told me that they're only alive today because, uh, in one example, a, a father went to a US Army base in Australia in the 1940s and got access to penicillin. So we all know what a, a, an amazing discovery that has been and that it saved so many lives. So uh, I would like to sort of fast forward now to 2021 and talk about a, a very unfortunate lady who was admitted to my hospital. So she was living with her family in the capital city of an Asian country. And this country uh, has a low middle income uh, country economy. And uh, our patient developed fever and respiratory symptoms, and not surprisingly, in 2021, was uh, found to have COVID-19. Unfortunately, her respiratory status deteriorated, and she ended up being admitted into the intensive care unit. So unfortunately, things uh, go in the way that they unfortunately often do. She developed a complication of her hospital stay, and this was ventilator-associated pneumonia. And Pseudomonas aeruginosa was isolated. Unfortunately, it was resistant to all beta-lactam antibiotics, all fluoroquinolones, and was only susceptible to polymyxins and some aminoglycosides. And this is a, an all too familiar uh, antibiotic resistance profile. So this was her causative organism, Pseudomonas. And she received a polymyxin that was, after a bit of a false start, as often happens, uh, while waiting for susceptibility results to come back, she had been receiving a beta-lactam antibiotic, which was microbiologically inadequate. And then because she was an Australian citizen, she had an intercontinental transfer 
back to my hospital. And when admitted here, we found that she had renal impairment due to the polymyxin that she was receiving. And that also she had received, had developed a complication, which is what we call empyema. So a collection of pus uh, in the, the pleural space. And this required surgical drainage. And in the opinion of the treating team, she needed a long course of antibiotics, six weeks of antibiotics to potentially cure this infection. So the susceptibility was confirmed only to polymyxins, one aminoglycoside, and a sidera 4 cephalosporin, which was not available in Australia. And unfortunately, in the opinion of the treating team, which I certainly concurred, with which I concurred, a six-week course of a polymyxin or an aminoglycoside was going to mean the end of her kidneys and she'd end up on dialysis. So what would happen if she was in your particular country? If she was in the US or Western Europe, she probably would have been able to receive a, uh, a beta-lactam, but perhaps a citrophore cephalosporin uh, that could have been used. In Australia, luckily, uh, I was able to obtain this antibiotic via a compassionate use scheme. But had she stayed in uh, in the country in Asia, almost certainly she would have died. And in a best case scenario, she would have had a survival, but an ongoing need for hemodialysis. So we all know, and Hanan uh, put forward very nicely, the, the fact that we do face a global AMR crisis. But in a way, it really is a global antibiotic availability crisis. So, you know, even if I look at my own country, if I look at recently approved drugs, approved by the FDA, and look at how long the Therapeutic Goods Administration, our Australian regulatory authority, has taken to uh, approve these drugs, and it's not their fault, it's when um, the companies submit their uh, approval requests, you can see in many circumstances uh, it takes over five years from the time of FDA approval. And in fact, there are some recent uh, combinations of beta-lactam and beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations, one of which has been available in the US uh, for more than four years, and we still don't have it available in Australia. Now, Kevin, uh, and John have both recently had this publication in Clinical Infectious Diseases, looking across 14 high-income countries and what are the delays and what is the status of patient access in those particular countries. And you can see there US 17 uh, drugs available, but down to a place like Canada, only two. Uh, you can see Japan has only five. And the delays uh, to launch are really, really considerable. You can see on that y-axis the number of days. And uh, 1,400 days is a, an awful long time to get access to some of these antibiotics. Now, of course, I'm talking from a very privileged circumstance in high-income countries. If I was in a, a low or lower middle-income country, unfortunately, I'd be traveling along this road. This is a road in South America called the road of death. And unfortunately, unfortunately, if we've got a patient in an intensive care unit in many parts of Asia, Africa, South America, uh, Eastern Europe, and you encounter a resistant organism, you're going to fall off that cliff. You're not going to survive. You're not going to have access to uh, less toxic antibiotic alternatives. So is the antibiotic pipeline dry? Well, I, I think the answer is that it's not dry. And this is data from the Pew Charitable Trust, which is a, a website resource that many of us go to. 
And uh, there are at least 43 new antibiotics that are in the development pipeline. And you can see that they are across a number of different phases, phase one, phase two, phase three. And we look at, if we look further at the Pew data, they show that uh, of infectious diseases drugs, if they get into phase one, 20% will end up being approved by the FDA. If they get into phase three, about 60%. So it's not a sure bet, but obviously that the chances increase as drugs uh, progress across the different phases of, of testing. Now, I, I love Russian authors, and I love the opening line of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And I think looking back at antibiotic development, every antibiotic developer that has failed is unhappy in their own particular way. And I'll give you just one example of, of what, unfortunately, we do need to avoid in the uh, antibiotic development pathway. This is a, a well-known case study, a Kajan. And a Kajan had a, a novel aminoglycoside, got through phase one, got through phase two, got through phase three, was FDA approved, had a beautiful uh, New England Journal paper with this lovely uh, illustration. And it even uh, was tested in very resistant organisms with some survival advantage. But then uh, what happened? There was very little uptake of the drug. There was uh, very few sales. And that equation of a huge amount spent in development and trialing of the antibiotic, and yet uh, very little money returned, obviously led to a bankruptcy of the, the company. So I want to conclude just with some perspectives as a clinician. And this is a perspective I've gained from my own clinical experience uh, and talking to, to colleagues around the world. Now, I'm just going to stick to, to bacteria here. I'm not going to talk about uh, the whole myriad of other microorganisms. But going through this little list, if I have a metallo-beta-lactamase producing organism, whether it be an Enterobacterales or Pseudomonas, I'm in a tough spot. Carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter, uh, a huge problem, particularly in low and middle income countries. And throughout the world, we encounter rarer non-fermentative gram negatives often with uh, pretty kooky names, but they're often with incredibly difficult antibiotic resistance uh, profiles. Uh, a rapidly growing mycobacterium, mycobacterium abscessus, is a problem in many settings, whether it be cystic fibrosis, other forms of lung disease, sometimes in skin and soft tissue infections, but a, a really tough nut to crack. And then on a very uh, frequent basis, we're seeing patients with perhaps complicated urinary tract infections with ESBL producers or carbapenem resistant enterobacterales and not having oral options to treat those patients. And finally, gonorrhea. We've moved very much to injectables for gonorrhea. And yet for this common infection, we certainly do need oral options. So from a personal perspective, from a physician's perspective, how am I going to get antibiotics to treat those infections? Well, it's complicated, but I guess that's really what we're here for tonight, to uh, look at the different perspectives, how we're going to get access to these antibiotics. Thanks very much. Yeah, and thanks, David, for those com for those uh, comments. You're right; it is com it is complicated. And I have a colleague who likes to joke that if you invent a bad antibiotic, nobody will use it. You invent a really good new antibiotic, everybody saves it, which 
means they don't use it very often. And I, and I think that's the, you know, the, that's the key lesson of this area is that we want the new antibiotics, but actually you personally don't want to use them very often, right? I mean, I, right? Yeah, you, you, you'd rather only maybe a couple times a year you need something like like an innovative amino glycoside. So um, thanks for that because it sets us up for the next conversation, which is a, a, a presentation by uh, Kevin Otterson, um, who is the among his many other activities, he is a lawyer who wound up running Carbex, the world's largest preclinical antibiotic developer. And he has spent a lot of time thinking about uh, the issues of how to how to manage the question of why that company went out of business and what can you do to fix that and what and what is the what are the possible tools that we could use uh, at, a, at a financial uh, global political level to do that. So um, he's going to present today. This actually is the debut presentation of a, of a new bit of modeling that we've all been uh, eagerly uh, waiting for. So I'm going to turn it over right now to Kevin uh, to uh, uh, take us into his discussion of how how we uh, how we think about innovating for antimicrobials and what kind of uh, financial models are required to make that happen. John, thank you for that. I'm grateful to be here. I want to emphasize that I'm here as a professor. This is my academic work. Uh, there's an impressive list of people here who disclaim any responsibility for what I say today. Um, I'm grateful um, for uh, also the fact that uh, I'm able to present today with uh, no financial conflicts of interest at all uh, to, dis to disclose because at Carbex, we can't have any ties to any antibacterial companies. And and that enables me to say that what I'm presenting today is is my own work, my own opinion, and and no one else's whatsoever. But I do gratefully acknowledge the fact that uh, the the core model here. I wanted the model to be something that the pharmaceutical industry recognized as authoritative, and so I began with the core model that was provided by Pfizer. Uh, three things I want to get across today: just uh, how important antibiotics are to so much in our in our healthcare system, and broader. The fact that the economics of the system, the way that we reverse for antibacterials, is grinding these great scientific works to dust. Uh, we need a different way to think about this. We need to be paying for the value of these antibiotics, not their volume sold. Uh, we call that concept delinkage. And then uh, to present some of the top level uh, results from my health affairs paper that I published yesterday, talking about how large should these global antibacterial pull incentives be. Um, you know, should there be 1 billion, 2 billion? How do we know? And so I'm going to try to talk that through with you this morning, uh, Boston time. Uh, thinking about uh, the value of antibiotics to other things within healthcare. And, and honestly, I could have added 10 other columns to this, 10 other disease states. You can take a look across and, and the, the sources are in the footnotes, but just look at that first one on cancer. The second leading cause of death of cancer is infection. If you successfully treat the cancer, but the patient succumbs to a bacterial, viral, or you know, fungal infection, uh, you've not succeeded. At least the patient and the family doesn't think that. There's a tremendous value to having antibiotics as a safety net. All the things on this list, and many things not on this list, would be more dangerous, you know, less beneficial, um, more costly, take longer if it weren't for effective antibiotics uh, underlying them. This is from the same paper that David mentioned earlier, but just a more colorful graphic version of it. But I want to emphasize a couple things. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry I don't have Australia on here. And, and I, I was told that if I did, Australia would come in at the, at the sad end of the spectrum, but I don't know exactly how sad. Um, but this is seven members of the G7 plus seven other high income countries in Europe. And notice that even though 14 of these drugs were approved by the European Medicine uh, Agency, EMA, that they're still not necessarily being launched throughout Europe. So that tells you that even with an approval in hand, a company has to think twice and, and wait years before it's worth it to launch the drug in Spain or Greece or, or Denmark or wherever else you see on this chart. And, and that's just an extraordinary statement. Um, you have an approved drug ready to go and for national reimbursement reasons, just the incremental cost of launching in a country, uh, you still hold off sometimes for years with an approval in hand. 
right? So that tells you that there's something seriously amiss on the way that we reimburse for antibiotics. So thinking about why this market isn't working and, and all the things that antibiotics do for us that really the market, it's hard for it to capture. So, you know, if you take an antibiotic, you can prevent transmission to other people. How, how do you exactly do you write a contract um, for the, if you're an antibiotic company? How do you capture that value uh, for the people who don't get sick, you know, because your antibiotic prevented onward transmission? A lot of what we think about in, in, in antibiotics are ways to make bacterial evolution less dangerous and you know, let's be narrow spectrum, let's not damage the microbiome, let's not, uh, you know, pour antibiotics into the environment, let's be careful with it. Part of that goal is so that antibacterial evolution over the next decade or decades is less dangerous. Um, how is that value captured at all in our current reimbursement system? Uh, how, how do we reward people for doing the right thing on that issue? This free writing, really almost everything on the previous chart, but think of all the money being made in oncology, on cancer. And, and the way that these drugs and these therapies depend on antibacterials, but um, are, are, are the cancer therapies paying something to support antibacterial R&D? No. It's easy to free write on this issue. It's easy for other people just to rely upon it to figure someone else is gonna get it done. And, and that's a, you know, I guess it's a rational choice individually. It's a terrible choice for society. We need to be paying for antibiotics that won't be used at all or won't be used very much today. That really are there for the preparedness future value. And if we scamp on any of these things, we have less antibacterial R&D than we really need to have. Uh, this is really saying the same thing, but uh, more in health technology assessment or law and economics sort of language. Um, enablement is that blue slide showing how antibiotics supports all of healthcare. Transmission is that example that I gave on, on preventing onward transmission. Uh, but think of insurance. You know, what was the value, if we had had it, of having a treatment against COVID in uh, December of 19 or a vaccine against COVID in December of 19? If we'd had it and used it and, and, and snuffed this pandemic, you know, in its infancy, you know, when, when it was still just in a single city, uh, perhaps, then uh, that would have been successful and great for the world, a tremendous value for the world, but the company would have only sold a small number because it was successful in snuffing things out. What is the insurance value of antibiotics? I say that when we get to the bottom, I've done serious work on these issues, these steady values, that the total value for antibiotics isn't going to be in the billions. It's value to society is going to be uh, much larger than that. It's going to be a number that starts with a T. It's going to be trillions of dollars. And yet, as you see on the right, these companies are being ground in the economic dust. Uh, interesting science, approved products, but no economic reward. So the solutions that much of the community have come around is push and pull incentives. I lead the largest preclinical push incentive in the world. And we're not going to talk much about CARBEX today. Uh, I'm very proud of what we've done, but the focus today is not on CARBEX. I will say to David that we've had a project or two from the University of Queensland. And so we, we do find the best science wherever it may be all the way around the world. Uh, I want to highlight more all of the other actors. So CARBEX is, is, is in this red chain, but think of all the basic research without which groups like us wouldn't have anything to touch because there wouldn't be anything interesting coming out of a, of a university laboratory. But then moving to the right, Carbex stops at phase one. Who's gonna pick up and pay for the clinical development? You know, BART has been the global leader, bar none, on, on this issue and, and, and paying for these things globally. And uh, and you see others, GARP now has two and maybe a third project and, and HERA in Europe is being stood up as, as a potential funder of these things. And then off on the on the far right, the pool incentives. And, Really, almost everything on that pull incentive list, with the exception of the United Kingdom, is, is proposed uh, or is not quite there yet. Um, my point is that all of these links are essential. If you drop any one link out of this chain, the whole thing fails. And, uh, and so we've got a pretty good system on these first three links today. Uh, what we lack is a, is a comprehensive and, and well-established pull incentive. And that's the focus of the work I'm going to present today. So just thinking a little bit, many of you have seen this one before. Carbex is all about innovation. 
But if all we did was innovation and we didn't care about access and stewardship, you know, that's that's going to be wasteful if we don't care about stewardship and it's unjust if we don't care about access. Furthermore, if you flipped it around and said, I'm going to be an access only organization, I'm going to get free antibiotics to the world, um, that's going to undermine stewardship. That's also going to make it more difficult for innovation if you develop free antibiotics uh, for the world. Uh, free is, is a not a good revenue model uh, for the companies. You get the point is that all three of these things, because of evolution, because of these uh, externalities from antibiotics, we need all three of these things together. And a clever way to solve all three of these things simultaneously is this concept of a delinked pull incentive, paying for value, not volume, so you can reward innovation, provide access, and not undermine stewardship simultaneously. So how big should it be? And this will be the focus of the rest of my time. Um, there's five government reports. Uh, John and I have been involved in, in several of these that try to answer this question. I'm a co-author in two of them. And uh, and these are major works that uh, look at this question either as a major part or, or a significant part uh, of the study. And all of them kind of converge around a, a value for a pull instead of a, something around a billion dollars when adjusted to, to current dollars. But there's, there's problems. And uh, I've spent the last two years uh, thankful for the sabbatical program at Boston University and, and taking a look and reread all these reports, two of which you know I participated as a co-author. And I have to say, first of all, that you know the estimates that com apparently converge around a billion are actually partially delinked market entry rewards. And what I mean by that is that um, it's a it's a cash um, reward to the company. But then the company still proceeds to sell the drug in the marketplace and make ordinary revenues on top of that cash reward. So that's we. So there's a you know a delinked market entry reward, but then they still sell and and do the the normal sort of activities in the marketplace. Um, these billion dollar values don't include that second piece. You know they're assuming that there's sales in the marketplace, but they don't tell the world the price of those sales in the marketplace. Uh, to put another way, it 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 underestimates the actual total cost. Whereas for a fully delinked uh, pull incentive, something like a subscription from the United Kingdom or the best direct from the United States, um, that acquisition cost is included together with the uh, with the reward of the company. Uh, most of these assume increased push incentives from 250 million to 800 million. And uh, it's great to assume that there's a lot more money for things like Carbex or for clinical development through BARDA and others. But that assumption of an increase would decrease the pull incentive required, right? And uh, while the reports assumed these increases, we haven't necessarily seen those things follow through. Uh, this is a significant understatement in the chemistry manufacturing control cost, the CMC cost, and the post-approval cost. It really, in, in the order of in excess of $100 million worth of additional costs that were not accounted for in, in most of these studies, uh, there was an error in the in the Sirkai study on preclinical success rates, which was unfortunately picked up by each of the remaining, uh, the, each of the subsequent studies. Um, and importantly, uh, Sirkai and and the other reports assume a uh, a high sales in the market. Remember, these are partially delinked, and so the the sales in the market make a big difference. And they assumed it uh, for a drug which at the time was it made sense. It was the best selling antibiotic of the time. But given all the experience we've had in the last decade, we don't think any drug is going to get anywhere close to that in terms of sales. So it's a it's an assumption that which artificially lowers the value of the pull incentive, and it's just not you know it's discordant with reality today. So fix these things up, and what you have is and put them through a model that's that is an expected net present value model, and uh, and that was the goal of my project. So. What do you need? And uh, I looked at several potential outputs. What is the global peak year sales? In other words, let's forget about pull incentives. Let's just do this all through sales. We did a straight up market entry reward, which is just a cash reward. Um, and then the company still makes money in the market, a subscription, which replaces market sales. It's a fully delinked award. And then um, this might be a little too wonkish for today, but there's a lot of uh, difficulty with the preclinical data. It's just really uh, thin and, and varies a lot. And so if you instead assume an acquisition at phase two for a phase two ready asset, 
uh, at a reasonable price, 500 million, then it's easy to, uh, to then simplify the model. And this is really the direction that I've gone uh, in this paper. So the key things in an expected rent present value model is you're looking out to the future, you're trying to project what's the chance that this drug will move from this first phase to a second phase and the third phase, what is it gonna cost uh, to go through those phases? Um, what's the you know the duration of that phase, and those are the types of parameters that make sense here. So it fully accounts for the failures as things go along, and also the time value of money because all those costs and then eventually revenues are discounted back to the present uh, at an assumed discount rate. And for this paper, it was ten percent. Also did lots of sensitivity testing, which uh, we can talk about if there's a question. So it was important to me that this is not based on secret data. It's not based on a secret model. Um, you know, it's an Excel model. It's in the Boston University public data repository today. Um, it's something I directed myself. And there's an extensive supplemental appendices which describes where all the data came from and, and, uh, and where it all, um, you know, how I, I dealt with it and adjusted it in, in some cases. But uh, importantly, this dashboard, which is the Excel model, allows any other researcher who has better data or maybe subsequent data that comes out in a year or two to be able to push it through the model and to see how it changes the answers. So it's a fully replicatable, every piece of it is in the public domain of, of the model and the data behind it so that anyone can, uh, can take a look at it and, and try to improve upon it or show us and the rest of the world where it misses the mark. So some of the results. Um, I used the subscription, uh, I report the data for the for the subscription plus acquisition. It's over 10 years, which is why it's called sub 10. Uh, I think it's the best estimate for what the Pasteur Act, what the UK program is trying to do. I just want to note that you need to subtract clinical push incentives from this number. So if your government provided $100 million worth of clinical support for this drug, you would just subtract that from the from that, that number. But um, you can see the numbers here. The, I, I provide both a, a upper bound and a lower bound and then a best estimate. Uh, the best estimate for the subscription model of a global pull incentive is $3.1 billion with a B. For market entry reward, you can see it's a smaller number. But again, that number does not include uh, the market sales of that drug uh, for a partially delinked market entry reward. The ranges are significant. Now, I want to emphasize that the data is not perfect on, on what exactly the cost would be to, to produce one of these drugs. Um, but the, I think the key you know, thing to take away from this is that the, it's, it's higher than what we've seen before. Uh, even the market entry reward is slightly higher uh, than the, the previous estimates for the reasons that I described a couple slides ago. And if we want to do a subscription and, and entirely replace market sales, then there will be additional payments. Uh, that are required. Did a lot of sensitivity testing, and I won't go over this slide now. But actually, most if a most of the sensitivity testing would have increased uh, the value. And the only way that you get significant decreases in the pool incentive on a global basis is to make much more optimistic assumptions about preclinical and clinical success rates, uh, which I think are dangerous because everything that I did here, all the public data, is based on what we've produced the last. 10 or 20 years. And um, you know, those aren't exceptionally novel antibiotics for the for the most part. Uh, they are mainly extensions of known classes. But if the intent of a pull incentive, a global antibacterial pull incentive, is to really bring something exciting and novel and first in class, something really spectacular, those things are likely to be higher risk, longer duration, higher cost. You know, they're not likely to be as easy as, as yet another drug similar to what we've had before. And so that's an important point. And so the ranges are important. And John and I have published previously, um, you know, an idea that really has been picked up in the Pasteur Act is that not all drugs are created equal. Many drugs that have been recently approved may get nothing under a Pasteur system. Some would get a small amount, and then depending on their outstanding characteristics, others can get something larger. A range is appropriate is part of what this data tells me. And as more countries adopt things, of course, there should be uh, adjustments as well. So both push and pull incentives, totaling several billion dollars, are required to make this thing economically attractive and sustainable. 
I'm talking here about what it would take to get the companies in, not what the value is to the world. Um, acquisition business case, I think, is the appropriate thing to focus on. Here's my best estimate. This is paid over 10 years. So if you think about it that way, $3.1 billion is, is $310 million worth of revenues fully delinked. So that's it for the company. They're not making other sales you know, in, in the world under this model. And, and that is sufficient. It certainly isn't going to make anyone, you know, exceptionally wealthy, but it's sufficient for them to meet these expected and the present value goals. And most uh, importantly at the bottom is that everything here on Pasteur and the UK pilot, these numbers are within the range of, of both Pasteur and the global incentive implied by the UK pilot. That means that if we get enough critical mass, if other high income countries don't free ride and pay their fair share, that uh, this system will actually work. You know, the numbers that are being talked about are actually in the realm of effective incentives, which I think is, uh, is spectacular news. It would be terrifying to know that we're uh, too low or too high by an order of magnitude. And so with that, um, I thank you and take a look at the paper at Health Affairs and, and all the other work I do. Um, at Google Scholar. Back to you, John. Fabulous. Thank you. And we've now toured three aspects of the problem of AMR. Um, Hanan gave us a, a global view on the need for antibiotics, vaccines, diagnostics, and clean food and clean water. David showed us a picture of a truck that reminds us that there are parts of the world where the access part is, is a big lift and we need to be thinking about and even in well-developed countries, access to important tools is tricky. And also between David and Kevin's presentations, we're reminded that innovation, true innovation, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of money invested into those products. And the more innovative the product, in many ways, the, 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 the less the sales should be because we actually would like to preserve those from the settings where we need them the, need them the most. And yet that actually creates a a perverse problem in terms of keeping the companies viable after they've invented the drug. And I, I think that the thing that we're going to now going to move into is how do you trigger implementation? And we've got three speakers who are all of whom have worked at a global political level from different angles. And I'm going to aim basically the same question at all of them to start off our, our panel discussion. You know, how do we encourage political leadership, commitment, and action? And that's, that's really sort of the, the, the whole theme here. We've got a lot of data. We've, we, we, we've measured the problem. We've got its size, its shape, its scope. Now, what the heck do we do? So our, our, for, for our first panelist to add to the, to the queue here, we've got Raman Lakshman Ryan, who is a, an economist who I met by his writings oh, probably 15 years ago, I think, Ramanan, uh, who has been working steadily over time at a variety of levels to to uh, to connect and to deal with with this problem. So, Ramanan, over to you for, for some initial reactions to what you've heard and this theme of how do we actually now move to action? Thanks, John, and uh, thanks, Kevin. Great, uh, great talk. Look forward to reading that paper. Uh, and uh, you know, certainly this is a good time to restart these conversations now that COVID is sort of settling down a little bit. Um, you know, I was just reflecting a few days ago for a talk that, you know, COVID has been an interesting thought experiment for AMR itself because it managed to get momentum, uh, you know, very quickly. In some sense, it showed what the world was capable of if there was a true emergency which was staring the world at the face and the quantum of resources and attention that was you know, available and ready to come to the table. Now, of course, with new antibiotics, we unfortunately can't develop new antibiotics in eight months like we did for a COVID vaccine. And this is where there's a divergence between our ability to, to address this pandemic, a new an AMR pandemic uh, with, the, uh, with the alacrity that, that COVID was, uh, that was possible to address COVID. And there's also been, uh, I guess, some idea about how uh, you know, countries have responded to COVID or how populations have responded to COVID in terms of antibiotic consumption. And interestingly, there's a big, uh, you know, developed developing country divide. In many developed countries, antibiotic consumption actually went down 
in developing countries and low and middle income countries, antibiotic consumption went up, indicating that antibiotics are really a backstop for the health systems. When nothing else is available, you can't get it better in a hospital. Um, you know, you really don't have proper diagnostics, and people turn to antibiotics as sort of a, um, you know, as as sort of a, uh, you know, salvation in some sense because they're seen as safe. Uh, potentially effective, regardless of what the condition is. And that, in a nutshell, underlies the problem with antibiotics, which is that people mistakenly think of them as, as being this cure-all um, you know, uh, drug that should be used uh, whenever there's nothing else available or even when there are other options. So I think the next steps, uh, sitting where we do, on, uh, you know, on sort of hopefully the, the tail end of... Uh, of the worst pandemic to have hit the planet uh, in the last 100 years, I think we have an opportunity. And we have an opportunity to correct some of the challenges or you know, the mistakes that we've made in addressing MR in the past. I think the first thing is that I think we need to simplify MR. We're way too complex. We need to focus on just you know four agenda items. I think we now have a lot of evidence that vaccines are a good way to avert antibiotic consumption. Uh, infection prevention and control is a second way of doing it. And uh, in the context of COVID, there's been a lot of attention on hand hygiene, on, on masking, on, uh, on healthcare infection prevention. And I think this is a good way to, to, um, to segue into doing all of these in a, in a sustainable way going forward, which helps with AMR. The third is on this topic of new drug development. I think that one of the positive uh, uh, developments over the last five, six years on AMR has really been, you know, entities like Carbex, CAR-T, BARDA, all working together to get new drugs to market. And I think we can all agree that the situation, while not where it needs to be, is certainly better than where it was, uh, you know, just a few years ago. And the last point is really about, I think it's time to really act on the animal and environmental side and remove antibiotics where they are used purely as industrial inputs and not really for the purpose of improving animal or environmental health uh, or, or human health. I think that's one uh, next step. A second next step is that I think we need to build on progress that we've made on COVID in terms of helping people understand how we deal with infectious diseases. And I think here, um, you know, again, this infection prevention and acceptability of adult vaccines is really the ones that I'd, I'd sort of focus on here just because these are the places where people really understand that, uh, you know, adult vaccines are not a bad thing. Vaccination doesn't end only when you're, you know, when you're two years old. We might need vaccines our entire life. And I think we really need to also continue global momentum and international fora. We had a high point in 2016. Uh, when AMR was only the fourth health topic to be addressed at the high-level meeting at the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, we've lost considerable momentum since then. Um, and, you know, part of it is thanks to COVID as well, but part of it is because we didn't have a necessary next step in terms of the political agenda. Uh, I think the things that we have done well are to involve a broader set of stakeholders in entities like the global uh, you know, leaders group uh, to be able to bring in people into the thought process and AMR who don't come from the world of antimicrobial resistance, you know, at least it, as it was you know, prior to 2016. But I think we have a long way to go. Um, and, uh, and I think this engaging minds of people on antimicrobial resistance is going to be a collective responsibility for all of us and without that, uh, we're not going to make, uh, you know, there's going to be some other agenda that gets on the table and AMR is really going to get left mm -hmm. behind. So uh, mm -hmm. these are just some thoughts in terms of what the next steps might be for us uh, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, of taking this agenda forward. Thank you. Yeah, super. I mean, and, you know, that I, I like your list. Simplify AMR, leverage the lessons of COVID and keep don't lose momentum kind of keep keep moving things along and you know what you've and you actually pointed in your uh, final comments to, at the global leaders group and so i i want to pivot and introduce the next two panelists because both of them uh come to us one from a more technical background and one from a very much a a government background to uh, share with us some views about 
again, this theme of how, how do we catalyze the next steps? You know, how, how do we encourage political leadership, commitment, and action? And so um, our, our next panelist to introduce is Honorable Yasuhisa Shiozaki, who, again, I, I could spend the entire tele teleconference reading everybody's bios. It's just, there's just so much to say about each person. Let me just say he has been plugged in deeply to how things work at a very high government level. I know he's he's recently re retired from being a member of parliament uh, and, and is but is now firmly engaged still with the global leaders group. And so, yes, uh, he said, talk to us about political leadership, commitment and action. How do we make it go? Thank you very much, John. And uh, um, well, political leadership, uh, uh, as we already discussed, uh, uh, is always effective and vital. Uh, for change, for change, and in every field, I guess, and especially uh, the antibiotics uh, uh, innovation. I think uh, uh, we do need a new type of incentives, uh, anyway. So, uh, in order to accomplish that, I, I guess uh, uh, we do need uh, political leadership. And uh, uh, so. Uh, let me share my own experience as a politician working for uh, AMR so far. Uh, AMR as a policy issue has a long history since the uh, mass production of the penicillins that uh, we just talked about uh, 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 started in early 1940s, I guess. And actually, uh, Dr. Fle uh, uh, Alexander Fleming uh, already touched upon the name. Uh, who discovered penicillins, uh, predicted the emergence of drug resistance in his lecture at the uh, Nobel Prize Award Ceremony in 1945. Now, however, it was only recently that we started to see serious political leadership, commitment, and also action on this issue. It was around uh, 2014 and 2015 when political attention toward AMR reached its highest level among head of states and uh, government. As soon as I took up my uh, assignment as health minister for Japan in uh, 2014, I realized that, that the uh, importance of uh, this issue and the vital role that political leaders, especially health ministers, had to play. And uh, I took uh, every opportunity at the highest political fora, including the G7, the G20, and the UN General Assembly to raise AMR uh, uh, as an item on the global agenda in order to maintain political momentum. Political commitment at the highest level in recent years has successfully transformed this issue. Political leadership led uh, uh, many countries to enact national action plans that we already talked about, offer public funding for R&D into new medicines uh, uh, with pull and uh, push incentives and uh, create several regulatory measures for the appropriate use of antibiotics for both people and animals. That said, uh, uh, we must recognize that our action to curb the emergence of AMR is still not enough. We need to maintain commitment from the political arena. In particular, political leaders have a large role to play in securing public financing for this issue, including topics such as incentives that we already talked about for antimicrobial uh, uh, innovation. This topic should be discussed more at the G G7, which is the top main t one of the main topics that uh, Global Leaders Group on AMR uh, is working on. At the same time, I would like to uh, caution that a top-down political approach, uh, though important, will not be sufficient. We do also need uh, to see bottom-up movement from citizens and uh, probably civil society. Political leaders may understand AMR. What is it? Why it is important for them to address the issue and how to approach it. 
On the other hand, uh, AMR is still not well understood among the general public. For us to produce a tangible outcome, it is important for each citizen to change their behavior, including the way that they use antibiotics and choose their food. Public awareness and campaigns are important to encourage political leadership. Compared to topics such as cancer or dementia, there are fewer patient advocacy campaigns for AMR. We must foster public interest in this issue in order to further mobilize policy leaders. Every stakeholder, not only politicians, but the private sector, academic and civil society have a role to play in empowering the public. It is important to uh, put effort toward this issue as well as the, we encourage political leaders to act. And uh, I guess uh, uh, now is the time, after, especially after uh, G7 discussion in the UK this year, uh, to come up with the uh, right solution on full type of incentives and others also. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah th thank you for those talks. And, and it's it's really always interesting to hear how these conversations evolve. You know, the, the, the stuff that occurs at the UN General Assembly levels way above my pay grade. And it, and I think it's, it's really instructive to have your voice here today about how that sort of thing moves. Um, and let, let's now move on to our third panelist and talk about um, the, the, the same question. Um, but from a slightly different perspective. So our, our, our final panelist is, is Dr. W Dr. Lothar Weiler, who is also part of the Global Leaders Group. And you'll see from his CV, he has been plugged into lots of things globally. He's also the president of the Robert Koch Institute. So he's, he's really thinking hard about the science part as well. So sort of combines the political side with the science side. So Dr. Weiler, uh, over to you to th again, think about what does it take from your perspective, to catalyze political leadership, commitment, and action? First of all, um, it, it gives me great pleasure to, to have the opportunity to talk here with these eminent people. And, and I, I have to say that I vividly remember uh, when I met uh, Minister Shiozaki first time at the G7 meeting here in Berlin. I had been in office just for uh, five months or so, if I recall it correctly. And I remember that the, the top issue here was AMR, and particularly when it comes to the, um, the market failure and the development of new antibiotics. And um, as you perhaps may remember, I brought in the aspect of surveillance, which I always considered very, very important. And um, I come to my uh, first point. First of all, I'd like to echo what has been said before. Um, absolutely, um, particular uh, Ramana, what what you mentioned, of course, you 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 hit the whole spectrum of of the issues that we are targeting when we're talking about antibiotic resistance. But let me make uh, um, perhaps some further further additions of. Uh, let me sh uh, share with you some further thoughts. Absolutely, we have to simplify this issue of antibiotic resistance for the general society, for the general people, for the common people. But when it comes, of course, to the medical professionals, it's a highly, highly challenging area if uh, patients pop up, as has been nicely shown by uh, Kevin Otterson, um, um, by, by um, David Patterson, sorry. But the issue here that I am taking is the issue of a public health institution. Public health means that basically you want to have a world where the chance of people to get infected is as low as possible. Yeah? We're talking about clean water. We're talking about uh, life, living conditions. We're talking about equity. So we're talking about a world that gives each and every individual a chance not to get infected. So prevention of infection. This is when it all starts. I don't want to see a patient in the hospital to get infected or where, 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 whatsoever. I want to minimize the number of infections 
on a global scale. This is the first step we have to take. And if you think about this, there are many things you basically, by educating people, by providing better living conditions, you reduce tremendously the number of infections by behavioral changes. Or, but whatever you think about, you reduce the number of infections. By reducing the number of infections, of course, you directly have an impact on the number of resistant bacteria. So that's, that's, that's for sure. So that's, that's very important. This is a key point. And, and all the different issues we have in the uh, IMR action plan that was set up by WHO some years ago, you have all these issues. The other issue is when you now look at COVID, I consider this, of course, a huge opportunity. COVID has shown that when there is a crisis, the world is able to react. But again, we're talking about an infectious disease. So again, disease prevention, infection prevention is now on a higher stake. And we should use this also to reduce infections when it comes to antibiotic resistant bacteria. This should be really, this, this is a key moment when we should be able to teach many, many people worldwide that it's worth to work on infection prevention, to behave differently, to take up hygienic measures. And, and here is the key issue. From what I learned, particularly from the political side, but also from all other sides, you do not concentrate on too many crises at the same time. You have one particular crisis, you want to solve it, and you get exhausted. And look at COVID right now in many countries. Fourth waves are skyling up, but the impact of really reducing it, of, of new measures, that people are already getting exhausted. So we have to link the, the AMR area because it's a, an infectious disease. We have to link it to the hygienic and prevention area of COVID-19. This is something we should do. And in addition, I think if you simplify it, we also have to bring it together with other issues. If you have four or five crises, let's take the climate crisis. There's also a part of the climate crisis is causing infectious disease because biodiversity is reduced. You, you poison your environment with antibiotics. You, you produce an, another amount of antibiotic resistant bacteria. So you could, we should think about where are crossing points of these different areas that we identify that can be make a difference in all of these different areas? Let's point them out and let's find solutions for this. And another thing that I, I now see from the from the particular from the political point of view, um, we were so lucky on the one hand that coronavirus stuck us because we knew already before this virus hit the world, that this virus has one particular um, protective antigen. So it's pretty easy in principle, not always does it work, but it's pretty easy in principle to produce a vaccine. And we have seen that vaccines make a difference. We can prove this again. And of course, we know that vaccines also make a difference when it comes to antibiotic resistance. However, it's much more complex to produce anti -vac uh, vaccines against bacterial pathogens. And this is now an issue that I see when I talk to some decision makers and politicians. They basically, some of them, think, oh, it's too so easy to produce a vaccine. So we can cover the problem, you know, that, that's also, that's the downside of it. And so, but, but we will not be able to produce a vaccine against each and every pathogen in 100 days. Yeah? However, how ma however many uh, scientists we put on it. So the point that I want to make is, we have to strengthen the public health area for the best of all of us, for the best of reducing each and every antibiotic uh, infectious disease. We have to put more efforts into health equity, all these classical public health issues. And when we talk about AMR, we should also find the, the, the key aspects that are also problematic in other areas, like pandemics, like uh, you call in uh, any infectious disease, <clears throat> like in climate change. If you bring certain issues together, basically some like, like a small golden bullet that we can tackle many other issues in addition, we should concentrate on these. And this is something that I think we are particularly looking in the global health, uh, global leaders group, that we want to 
transform these and over all the four areas that we're talking about. We're talking about medicine, we're talking about veterinary medicine, we're talking about agriculture and environment. And there we have to find um, areas and sectors which overlap. And then we could more easily communicate about these overlapping uh, areas. Maybe we could make a difference there. Because we all know all the recipes to tackle AMR. They are all known. We have a problem to provide new antibiotics. But we know all the recipes. We know about antibiotic stewardship. We know about hygiene. We know all these other things. But obviously implementing them is not easy. And uh, the targeted use of, of uh, antibiotics is, of course, um, an, an issue of education of, of professional medical people. So um, I think this is something that we learned out of COVID-19. There is enough knowledge, there is enough data, and there is, uh, on a global level at least, but um, on a local level, there often is not enough data. And this is the last point I want to make. What we've also learned is suddenly the world is looking at dashboards. Yeah? Everybody's looking at a dashboard, seeing numbers popping up at Johns Hopkins University or our world in data. If we could use this momentum and suddenly everybody would look at AMR dashboards worldwide, maybe we could get more momentum in this. And again, we could link these different tools because nobody can look at 10 different dashboards. Yeah? So again, the point here is let's use a, a small amount of, of, of tools that everybody can take a look on and then make our decisions from this. Because on a local level, you need local data, good data, um, and, and then only you will be able to come from data to action. And this, of course, uh, the local, the national um, the plants, the national antibiotic plants uh, need to be enforced in, in each and every country. And as Hannah already uh, alluded to, not many of these um, nations have already an AMR action plan. Thanks. Wow. Well, th thanks for that, for those impassioned comments. And again, I, I'm always fascinated to hear about how conversations evolve at the global level. And actually, you're making me simplify my Ramadan's list even more. I'm, I'm down to connect crises and leverage COVID as the basis for communication upwards and downwards about everything. You know, it's, it's kind of like you can often get a, get a good start with that. So well, let's actually um, shift a bit to a question of, of data, because it, one of the things that I have learned from several of you is that in order to catalyze political action, we would like to see these D-linked awards come into, come into play. We're going to need to be able to provide information to uh, policymakers about what's needed and why it is needed. So I have one very technical question for Kevin that came in in the chat. And, it, and the question has to do with, you said $3.1 billion. Is that the same number for all new antibiotics? And if not, how is it going to get adjusted? So can you comment on what's going on there? Absolutely not the same number for all antibiotics. So we think if you looked at the antibiotics from the past decade, you would say that the great majority of them probably would not get any sort of Pasteur you know, subscription award. And uh, looking forward to a, a highly innovative, more innovative pipeline, you would think some things would barely make it over the, over the, the bar and we get the smallest award. Um, some would be you know, intermediate and, and some might be spectacular. And it's important and should, should be rewarded at a higher rate. And it's important to note that you may not have all the data on the, on the moment of the first FDA or EMA approval. It may take years to get the data that shows that what was a good antibiotic is actually a spectacular one. And so I'm grateful that in Pasteur, there's um, at least proposed a way for companies to come back in five years, you know, after they have better data and to apply for the, the higher award. Because um, we can't pretend that all that data will be available at first approval. Well, and I'd also would add to that, if you want to look at an example of generating data, the UK's pilot has already laid out a point scoring scheme for what's interesting about a new drug, and they've used it to pick drugs. And I think that's actually an example of generating information about how you can 
how you can uh, couch your, your decision making in, in quantitative terms that other people can, can understand. So thinking a little bit more broadly about kinds of data that make a difference, I, I'm just going to warn all of you, I want to rotate around and ask, what kinds of data do you think would make the most difference to have for the next step in the conversations that you're looking for? Uh, you know, you know. Uh, let's actually. I'm going to pick on Ramanan to start with. So, you know, you. you I, I look at a lot of the work that you're you're currently doing, and I think about getting the government of India involved. When you think about the kinds of data that are required to get a government involved, what what do we need, uh, and do you have it? And if you don't have it, how are we going to generate it? Uh, thanks, John. You know, actually, Lothar mentioned uh, the issue of uh, dashboards. And in fact, uh, you know, we took a crack at this on in the State of the World's Antibiotics Report in 2021. This is the second of the State of the World's Antibiotics Report. And uh, what we realized was uh, that, first of all, uh, we need to focus on, I mean, there's not one stakeholder for AMR. The stakeholders for AMR are the people who run the vaccines program, the people who run IPC, people who run WASH. Uh, you know, people who are taking care of, you know, public health and primary care in general. Uh, there are people who, you know, in, involved in medical education. Because you have different people who are responsible for different pieces of AMR, all of whom, or at least many of whom, will have to participate in helping us make progress. We need to have these multi-sectoral, you know, broader sets of dashboards. We did come up with these dashboards, I believe, for about 100 countries in that report. They're all online. The state of the world's antibiotics 2021 and what it tells you really is that there's highly variable progress on on different input indicators and output indicators on amr whether it be you know consumption vaccination ipc all of these uh, i think a related point here is that we don't want to over focus just on antibiotic consumption Antibiotic consumption can be a good thing when it is appropriate because a lot of people still die because of lack of access to antibiotics. But without having a dashboard sort of an approach, we might hone down on things which are not the most critical things to, to focus on. Peter Collignor and I had done a paper you know, a few years ago, just published in Lancet Planetary Health, I believe, which showed that you know, consumption was not the primary driver of resistance in low and middle income countries. It was many other factors. And so we, we should sort of, you know, think a little more carefully about what drives AMR and not just over-focus on, on consumption. That said, I think there's a big difference. And John, you know this because you and I have both, you know, served on the U.S. Presidential Advisory Committee uh, on combating AMR. And, uh, and what I think worked for the United States to have made progress, significant progress, and have caught up with, uh, with Europe is really the fact that the CARB Action Plan had targets. Uh, every one of those had targets, and every agency knows what they're chasing. And I think 2016, the big mistake was having lost a major opportunity to have set targets for whatever it might be. You can set targets saying, I want to have my top 10 hospitals in my country have a stewardship program. I want to have reporting of data from you know, the 20 largest wholesalers of antibiotics. The targets don't have to be just on drug resistance or, you know, proportion of isolates that are resistant. But I think we lost an opportunity for targets. And if we go back and think of the targets that we want to have on these multiple sectors, it will also then inform us of the data that we would then need to make sure that we are reaching those targets. So one is a forward thinking, you know, Yes, there are, you know, there are multiple, you know, we need a dashboard approach, but then it's selecting what goes into the dashboard. Let's also have a conversation on targets because then the target drives what data you actually collect. Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, um, David Lothar, you also, he said, any one of you want to add to that theme about data that you would find useful in your conversations? I just saw David raise his hand, go. Yeah, so John, you know, I'm, I've been really struck in the last couple of days, the 5 million uh, deaths related to COVID figure came up. And, you know, obviously the CDC in their threat analysis did have, uh, you know, deaths and infections. But from a global scale, you know, we don't really have very good data. And 
you know, I think it is that sort of data that might make governments listen. Now, of course, it's very hard, you know, even in randomised trials, it's hard to say a particular person's death was caused by the infection. You know, sick people die, old people die, and sometimes they die with the infection or uh, you know, recently following an infection. But I think having some sort of um, accurate gauge, or you know, we're never going to get it perfect, but gauge of what is the impact in terms of lives lost, uh, I think that would be quite important and obviously categorised by infection type so that we can, I noticed one of the, um, there was a question in the chat about a league table and, you know, how are we going to work out what our priorities are and, and are potentially deaths attributable to certain forms of antibiotic resistance and therefore could that inform the, the need for certain antibiotics? Is that the, the way forward? Yeah, yeah. John? So, yeah, far away. I? Yes, sir. Can I? Uh, learning from the lessons in Japan this time about the COVID-19, the data of uh, uh, virus, especially variant virus, uh, I think uh, uh, our National uh, Institute of uh, Infectious Disease was very slow to disclose the data to the uh, uh, universities and uh, uh, research institutions. And uh, I guess, especially the genomic analysis uh, should be always be uh, uh, disclosed in order for other uh, 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 parties of uh, research and development uh, can easily uh, make research, a new research and uh, come up with the right solution to antimicrobial, you know, antimicrobial uh, uh, cases. And uh, so the disclosure of uh, uh, data by the government especially uh, is crucial to fight against the uh, antimicrobial resistance issue, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, you think there about the whole idea of global surveillance systems. Yeah, and Lothar, you commented on that a second ago. Yeah. Talk no, a little it, bit it, about what we need to be doing there. Yeah, no, exactly. So, so uh, of course, we need data on what we call the the burden of disease. Yeah, dalis, qualis, whatever you you like to have it. You need a a harmonized way of really get an idea what is the true burden of disease, the true burden of antibiotic resistance bacteria. This is a number that is needed to understand the magnitude of the problem. This is very, very important. And there is an, a, a technological way to do this, and we should push that this is done in each and every country. Uh, and this concept has to be promoted and understood. Um, because no, the, the, the toughest outcome is, of course, number of people lost, the lives lost. But there is a totally other dimension if you look into burden of disease calculation. And the second thing that I wanted to make, uh, an exactly uh, coming up uh, uh, what Minister Shiko uh, said, it's uh, we need global, open um, data that are right from the beginning disclosed for the whole global community and currently and of course to do this you need a generic technology and currently this technology is the so-called genomic surveillance issue that you uh, really um, decipher the genomes of these pathogens and by this you get a lot of information bioinformatic information not only for even being able to uh, produce or, or do research on new antibiotic uh, antibiotics, but in addition also, you understand the driving mechanisms, you understand the evolution of the pathogens, and the more of these data you liberate to the whole scientific community, the better you're doing. This is a, a global system, I think, is utmost important. And here I refer to the to the WHO hub that uh, has been or will be set up. In, in, in Berlin for the whole world, basically uh, trying to link 
certain surveillance tools via mostly via national public health institutes and disclose this data as soon as possible you need trust in all the governments you need to exchange this data as, as soon as possible and amr pathogens should be part of this global surveillance system i'm absolutely convinced that this we need an open data society this is building up trust and this is really important yeah no no question whatsoever about that it, it, and having those data available and yet we don't so how, how are we going to make that go forward all right so we're, we're into our last few minutes and unfortunately we there's never enough time for, for all the possible questions um I, I want to point back at one question out of the chat i'm going to modify it a little bit and it's, it points at the the, the story of a cajun and their new antibiotic and the questioner says well, they went broke but they did succeed in bringing a new drug to patients. So could that be considered a success? They succeeded in bringing a new drug to, to patients. So my, the question that I'd like to uh, point at Kevin and David quickly is, did they actually deliver to patients? Could you get the new drug? Uh, I mean, I think I heard the answer in your presentations, but you know, you, you, what, what are we gonna do to get these drugs available anything new in other parts of the, parts of the world outside the United States? David or Kevin? That drug is, uh, is something of an orphan now. Uh, with a, It was purchased at the bankruptcy estate by a, an Indian generic company who, um, you know, has is, is chosen not to continue with the application in Europe. Yeah. Um, it's, it's unclear whether this drug will be available anywhere. And certainly, uh, the company has not announced plans that I'm aware of to invest substantially in the post-approval ongoing development of that drug. Yeah, the withdrawal from Europe know. is very the withdrawal from Europe is very clear. They said we can't afford to meet the requirements. Does it make any sense, David? Anything to build on there because you've been thinking about low, low middle income country access? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I think there's a lot of lessons learned, and one of them is uh, if you're going to develop a drug for very difficult to treat infections, uh, you've got to think very carefully about where you're going to do the trials, for example. And clearly you cannot uh, go into it with the possibility that you spend, I don't know, a million dollars per recruited patient or, or whatever it might be. And so there's potentially a role for uh, trial networks, particularly working across lower and middle, middle income countries uh, that where you know resistance is really at its hottest uh, to to potentially bring those costs of of phase three trials da down now that's not it's a lot easier said than than done but obviously a lot of lessons from the occasion experience yeah, yeah. Okay, I hate to say it, but we're down to the last minute. So I'm going to actually have to sum it up. I cannot possibly get through all the remaining questions. But let me just say that I want to thank our, our speakers because uh, Lothar and Yasuhisa, you, the theme you've given me is about connecting crises uh, and, and, and global communication uh, about data and using it at a political level. And I'm delighted to hear what the, what the Global Leaders Group is doing. Ramanan, you pointed at the idea of leveraging COVID as a basis for communication. And I, and I like your list of four things, vaccines, uh, infection control, new drugs, the animals, the environment. And I think you can probably get a story out of, from COVID out of all uh, that, that lets you communicate about all of those, because that's what it actually takes to cause people to, uh, to really understand the issue. Um, you know, Kevin and David, thank you very much for giving us a tour of how drugs come forward and how they can fail even once they have demonstrated their value in the clinic and why access, the, 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 last, the last hurdles, among the last hurdles is the hurdle of, of access to the new drug around the world, being sure that the supplies are available. And finally, Hannah and Balki had to leave us. 
unfortunately, she was called into, into an, uh, another session. Um, and, and she gave us a, a, a great view of a global perspective on what is needed uh, to ensure that we actually have the drugs we need, need in the future. So if you come back to the overall theme for today, you know, our, 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 big, our big goal for the day was conversations about incentives to, to drive innovation and to how, we, how these need to interact with patient access. And I, I think we've covered that well today. I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors for uh, making this webinar possible and for doing it again a second year. And I look forward to future iterations of this conversation. So everybody, wherever you are, thank you for being here. Stay safe. We'll be in touch. Goodbye now.